So welcome. This is one of two PowerPoint presentations uh, for class number four, um, which is, as you know, of course, online. So um, I want to talk about religious identity and, and Catholicism in particular, uh, but I think much of it applies to people across various Christian uh, communities. Uh, before I get into it, um, just an interesting study uh, that was done by Pew, uh, which is the source of much of our reliable data about religion uh, in America in 2018. Um, they did a study of Catholics and Protestants uh, celebrated or occasioned by the 500th anniversary of Martin Luther, the beginning of the Protestant Reformation. Um, and when you, of course, look back at the Protestant Reformation and when you think of much of, uh, really, up until the 1960s, the animosity between Catholics and other Christians, um, how in a, an age, especially after the Second Vatican Council, where uh, ecumenism became acceptable and, in fact, uh, kind of the uh, law of the church in many ways, uh, that now we see uh, that people have actually come to understand that we are religiously more similar than uh, different. Uh, and that's pretty much across the board. There are some variations uh, by different groups, uh, as you can see when you look at the data. Uh, but I think uh, it's important to see in what will be coming, uh, what I will be presenting in this lecture, the challenges that we all face. Um, and that, in fact, all of us are more similar than different. And in a highly secular age, how important it is for us to be of one mind and heart as Christians uh, to evangelize our culture. This Chinese uh, character, I think, describes the situation well. Uh, it is the Chinese character uh, for crisis. And I think it is safe to say that there is a crisis of religion uh, in uh, this second decade of the 21st century in the United States, and it's even more so in Western Europe. The uh, character is that it is both crisis and opportunity. And I think we need to keep that in mind when we see some rather sobering and discouraging data. Uh, to see this as an opportunity for uh, preaching the gospel in a new way um, and to uh, find ourselves uh, not paralyzed by the challenges but energized uh, to move forward. So this is the uh, general picture uh, which has been consistent. The data are a little bit older uh, but in the last four years um, I think it's a helpful graphic that uh, the largest religious group in the U.S. are evangelical Protestants. And again, that self-identification, that could also entail people in more traditionally um, denominational churches. Um, you can see that mainline Protestants, uh, um, I suppose most of them would be you know, Episcopalians, Methodists, Presbyterians, Congregationalists, etc. Uh, where Baptists would fit in or how they would describe themselves, uh, maybe evangelical or mainline. Um, the big growth, of course, from 2007-2014 has been the growth of the unaffiliated of the nuns, 6.7% uh, growth. So, uh, and, and the decline of Catholics, uh, you can see, from almost 24% to shy of 21%. Uh, uh, and an even steeper decline of mainline Protestants. And, and again, these data confirm what we have experienced, I think most of us, anecdotally. Okay, so <clears throat> from 2014 to 2017, uh, over that time, uh, let's take a look at the U.S. population. So 1955, 71% Protestant uh, in 2017, 47% Protestant. Uh, Catholics, 1955, 24%, down to 22. Those who self-identify as other from 4% to 11. I would imagine much of that is due to immigration, the increase of uh, Islam, uh, and also uh, Asian religions. 
Uh, the big story, of course, is over this generation, uh, over this half century uh, plus, has been the growth of nuns. Um, and if you look at the age cohorts, uh, you can see it's even more dramatic. Uh, the younger you are, the more likely you are to have no religious affiliation. Um, and so you can see those figures for yourselves. Also, by the way, parenthetically, I put the PowerPoint up without narration uh, if you want to take more time to ponder some of these data. So among the millennials, as I said, when you look back, the younger you are, the more likely you are uh, to have no religious affiliation. Um, this is quite stunning and it's very recent. So 2017, 2013, 2015, uh, the percent of millennials who self-identify as nuns, dramatic increase. Uh, those who call themselves spiritual but not religious, again, a dramatic increase. And then those who would be atheist agnostic or nothing in particular. Sometimes the nuns are, well, could be people of faith, uh, but they have no religious affiliation. That's a different category than those who would say they're atheist or agnostic. Uh, so the nuns don't necessarily uh, abandon belief in God. They abandon belief in organized religion. But this 37% group uh, are the growth of, uh, they, they deny the existence or don't believe in the existence of God. Um, and the claim would be, if you look at all ages in the U.S., right, out of the entire population, are there 64 million atheists? Um, and, and again, those are people who have no belief in God. Uh, among those who do continue to have some affiliation, we look at um, the uh, switching. And, and that's become much more prevalent. Um, and you can see the same story. The unaffiliated, uh, that's where the big increase is. Uh, somewhat, according to Pew, uh, some increase in evangelical Protestantism. Um, a decline in historically black Protestant churches. Uh, a steeper, slightly steeper decline among mainline Protestants. And a, a huge decline among Roman Catholics. So this is a study done by the Barna Group, uh, and they're a, uh, a think tank that looks at uh, religious identity issues, uh, most of them coming from um, a uh, Christian non-Catholic uh, perspective. So, but they, they, they survey everyone, right? And um, I think this is quite telling, and it's very recent, um, in fact, published uh, within the past uh, month of May. So we look at the, um, as, as we had previously, we look at the generational uh, issues. So if you look at those who claim to be non-Catholic Christians, uh, this is, uh, as you see, 2016 data, right, collected then. 51% um, would claim to be uh, of elders uh, to be Protestant, 48% boomers, 43%, 44% millennial, 42% Gen Z. Um, figures for uh, elders among Catholics, 24%, 27% for the boomers, but then uh, a quite marked increase. It's an increase in other faiths, uh, non-Christian faiths, and again, mostly I think Asian religions and Islam. And, and then uh, the big increase in agnostics from 5% uh, of um, elders uh, to 8% of millennials, 13% would self identify as atheists, and 14% as none of these. So among church going teens, now these are people who have not uh, left uh, uh, religion. Um, this is what they uh, see uh, as uh, how they perceive the church. So 82% those who are positive, it's a place to find answers to live a meaningful life. It's relevant, uh, it can be yourself. Uh, people at church are tolerant of those with different beliefs. Uh, interesting 
where on the negative side, um, the church seems to reject much of what science tells us about the world. Uh, it's overprotective. People are hypocrites. The church is not a safe place to express doubts. The faith and teachings I encounter at church seem rather shallow, and the church seems too much like an exclusive club. Uh, interesting for you to look at these, uh, and for those of you, most of you, right, who work, or all of you really, who have some um, work with uh, teens and emerging adults, if this would ring true. Uh, this looks at non-Christians and, and barriers to faith, for those who do not claim to be Christian, um, and, and what is the issues, and again, it's done by generation, right? Um, the problem of evil and suffering. Uh, how does God allow that? The whole omnipotent, and yet if God is omnipotent, why do bad things happen? Uh, we had talked about hypocrisy. Uh, look at the millennials there, you know, 23, 31%. Um, the challenge of science and uh, revelation, science and the Bible, the whole question of biblical hermeneutics in regard to um, the literal nature of the scriptures uh, and, and the conflict, again, between science and scriptures. Um, and you can see the other things, too many injustices in the history of Christianity. Uh, interesting that the boomers are those who uh, have the highest kind of uh, sense of that. Things like the Crusades and slavery. Um, I used to go to church, it's just not important, or I had a bad experience uh, in church. Uh, the David Kinneman is part of this Barna group, and um, he wrote a very interesting book that I would recommend. Um, the church in the West is struggling to connect with the next generation. We are dealing with the immense technological, spiritual, and social changes that define our times. The changing nature of access new relational and institutional alienation. We are learning how to pass on a faith worth claiming in a new context. How can we give, how can we prepare the next generation to live meaningfully and follow Jesus wholeheartedly in these changing times? And how can the next generation rise to the challenge of revitalizing the Christian community for our mission and in the broader culture? So, um, yeah, a lot of work to do. This is the uh, PRRI, American Values Atlas. Uh, and again, same story. Um, if you look at those who are unaffiliated, who have no religion, the younger you are, the less likely you are to have any religious affiliation, which, as I said, is a crisis, but it is also uh, an opportunity uh, for those involved in ministries with young people, for example, schools, how schools can become places of evangelization. Um, more data about Catholics in particular. You can see the increase of former Catholics and a slight increase, so this is in the 21st century, of, um, of the number of Catholics overall. That is due to the fact that many immigrants, most of them Latino, but also Filipino, uh, and from other parts of the world uh, are Catholic. Um, so really, white Europeans uh, have left the church in very large numbers. Uh, those numbers of total Catholics would be down considerably if it weren't for uh, extensive immigration. So one-third of adults who were baptized Catholic are no longer. 10%, and I think that's even higher now, of all Americans are former Catholics. So if you were to break down, um, for according to Pew, uh, how people self-identify by various um, denominations within Protestantism, Roman Catholics would be the largest former Roman Catholics and then various evangelical groups, right? So half those raised Catholic leave the church, sometimes temporarily. Uh, so 52% leave the church. Only 11% of those come back, 28% uh, are ex-Catholic, and 13%, uh, according to Pew, 
are now cultural Catholics. I think in many ways, Catholicism and Judaism, uh, in terms of sociology of religion, have much in common. Um, I think a religion that uh, is practiced in highly symbolic ways, obviously, so there's a whole kind of way of worshiping, um, and also something about uh, Catholics and Jews uh, having bonded, I think, in, in especially in places in the Northeast, because they were both, for example, uh, excluded from Ivy League schools or certain clubs or certain neighborhoods. Um, now, that's ancient history in many ways. How Catholics find themselves uh, is this notion of the cultural Catholic or uh, cultural Jews or secular Jews. People who would say, yeah, I'm Catholic, but you know, I was raised Catholic, and yeah, we you know, celebrate Christmas, and yeah, we get together at Easter, maybe go to church, um, you know, maybe go to church if there's a funeral in the family and I don't want to cause a stir. But really, um, the culture of Catholicism I've retained, but the belief or active faith or having it really have any kind of significance in the way I make decisions about my life, that's pretty much gone. Uh, church attendance is, is another measure uh, of that. Um, and church attendance among Catholics by age and over time. These are very uh, recent data. So uh, again, the church attendance numbers that you see on the right column, uh, I think are actually higher than the experience of the local churches in the Northeast, in Boston and in New York. Uh, I think fewer than 25% of, uh, of, for example, of young Catholics uh, would attend church uh, once a week or have attended church in the past seven days. Uh, the 49% among uh, the 60 plus crowd, eh. but uh, again, I, I think that takes into account other parts of the country where Catholicism is more vibrant than here. Interesting comparison. Uh, if you look at church attendance data uh, from 1955 to 2017, um, in 1955, of course, before the, uh, well, even still, uh, technically, um, Catholics have an obligation to go to Mass every Sunday and during days of obligation under pain of mortal sin. Well, I mean, you look at the numbers, clearly people don't believe that anymore. Um, interesting among those who self-identify as Protestants uh, and Christians, again, that term Protestant and Christian, it would be interesting to have a conversation about that in class. I, I look forward to those who are, are not Catholic uh, uh, helping us understand that distinction or how, how you would call yourselves. Um, but in any event, uh, Protestants and Christian, non-denominational, I guess, um, who don't have an obligation to attend church, do attend church in higher numbers than uh, Catholics. Um, church, of course, is not the uh, weekly attendance at Mass. These are data from CARA, uh, the Center for Applied Research on the Apostolate out of Georgetown University, and they collect a lot of sociological data about Catholics in the U.S. So just look at the numbers from 2016, again, over the 21st century thus far. Uh, the great decline in the number of baptisms, first communions, confirmations, and marriages. Um, and I would imagine if you were to continue, let's say, by 2020, 2021, I think you'd have a decrease. Um, and again, anecdotally, how many people do you know who are cultural Catholics but who don't bother baptizing their kid? Or if they do, it's kind of a rite of initiation that is really pretty devoid of any kind of spiritual deeply religious uh, meaning. Um, so, one of the facts, and, and again, when I said some of the numbers are um, higher than one would expect around church attendance, uh, if you look at the Catholic Church in the U.S., there's been a real significant geographic shift um, from the Northeast and the Midwest, the Northeast, uh, where and Midwest where European immigrants landed. Uh, so it's where the church was built and established uh, beginning in the mid 19th through the 20th century. Uh, 
that there's been a real movement, either movement out of the church, but those who are Catholic uh, have also migrated to other parts of the country, uh, to the south and to the west. So as a result, you would find dioceses in the northeast and the midwest, closing schools, shutting down parishes, downsizing considerably, uh, empty churches, um, few vocations. Uh, some of the dioceses in the South and the West, it's a very different story. Uh, building churches right and left. Uh, I have friends in the Houston Archdiocese, and uh, they're building churches and opening schools, uh, and um, the combination both of migrants from the Northeast and from the Midwest, and also uh, the influx of immigrants, uh, especially of Latino immigrants. Um, so a very different picture geographically. There's also, of course, the shifting within urban areas of um, Catholics who tended to be heavily urban uh, back to the wave of European immigration. Uh, New York, a classic example. Uh, and then the kind of upward mobility, but also the outward geographic mobility uh, to the suburbs and increasingly to the exurbs. Um, and so in the Archdiocese of New York, you would find in the Bronx and in Manhattan um, a decrease, uh, the need to consolidate, combine, and close, uh, and yet there are parts of Dutchess County or Orange County uh, where um, you have to uh, increase the size of churches, uh, places that were little kind of, I suppose, chapels in vacation areas that are now uh, have a large number of permanent residents. So, so the geographic mobility piece is something to consider. Along with the geographic mobility, which you can see here, uh, is also the change in um, the ethnic identity of Catholics. So uh, of U.S. Catholics are white and Hispanic, 55%, um, down from 87% in 1991. So over uh, really, what, 28 years? And, and, and again, part of that is the geographic shift, as I mentioned, in the South and in the West, very heavily Latino. Uh, if you look at US Catholics uh, over the age of 65, 76% uh, white, non-Hispanic, 17% uh, Hispanic, and look at those figures uh, for US Catholics under 30. So clearly, we've seen the future of the Catholic Church in the United States, and it is Latino. Um, and uh, other studies, again, you can't read everything, um, but out of Boston College, uh, there are studies of the presence or lack thereof, uh, presence of Hispanics in Catholic schools that don't come anywhere near um, these data about the Need. So serving Latino populations has to be, for any Catholic institution, a very high priority. All right, let's look at generally at the whole issue uh, as we've seen time and time again. The younger you are, the less likely you are to be in any kind of um, relevant, vibrant way engaged in a traditional religious group. Um, the work of Christian Smith and his associates. Uh, Christian Smith uh, relocated with a very sweet deal uh, to Notre Dame, uh, and he has been doing studies of young people, the National Study of Youth and Religion, longitudinal studies, um, and he says a good deal of variation among adults and emerge, uh, adolescents and emerging adults that would be uh, young people in their 20s. Um, a third, he would say, have yeah, still some zealous, but kind of some affiliation. A third, kind of quite indifferent, and a third have nothing to do with organized religion. And this isn't just Catholicism. This is across the board. Uh, he said many of uh, their studies show uh, what they call a moral therapeutic deism. Um, and again, no time, can't go into that in any kind of detail, but uh, these number of these uh, excellent books uh, would, I think, be helpful to anyone with an interest in this. Uh, but, but it's sort of a feel good, no demand, be nice to people, um, a, a kind of a very superficial, um, what 
Bonhoeffer, I suppose, would call cheap grace, right? A, a, a Christianity with. So, the de facto creed God exists, who created and orders the world and watches over human life on earth. Uh, God wants people to be good, nice, and fair to each other, as taught in the Bible and by most world religion. The central goal of life is to be happy and feel good about oneself. God does not need to be particularly involved in one's life, except when God is needed to resolve a problem, I suppose. Yeah, that uh, reminds me of a colleague of mine uh, at BC, Peter Erasian, brilliant um, psychometrician who taught assessment and uh, in his office was a framed poster that said, as long as there are tests, there will be prayer in public school. So, you know, when you need God to resolve a problem, when you get the terminal diagnosis, etc. But otherwise, religion, God, faith, really no demands a kind of a, a very um, kind of superficial uh, religious uh, belief. What some have called it's the whatever view of religion. Okay, so um, he has also, uh, because with this massive ongoing longitudinal data set, he's also looked at Catholics in particular uh, and some of what he found, except for lower levels of church attendance, ironic again, given the fact that every Catholic is supposed to go to church every week, uh, Catholic emerging adults basically look like everyone else. Um, Teens that attend Catholic high school are significantly more religious five years later, according to their data. So these are looking at emerging adults, so these are uh, people that they have followed into their 20s. Much of the difference is attributable to the higher religiousness of the families and not so much to the independent effect of the Catholic schooling itself. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, a more recent 2018 publication uh, out of the uh, center at Notre Dame where Christian Smith and his associates work uh, is finding from a new national study of American emerging adults uh, called Understanding Former Young Catholics. Again, readily available online. Uh, so roughly one half of Catholic teenagers lose their Catholic identity by their late 20s. I'm not talking about an agenda for Catholic schools. But in this study, they would see among emerging adults aged 23 to 28, 12% uh, are Catholic. And remember the figures generally of um, Catholics of all 20% or 21% in the nation, but only 12% among emerging adults. 11% of emerging adults are former Catholics. Wow. Uh, and 77% other, uh, which would be, I suppose it could be, uh, any number of um, um, Christians, nuns, what have you. Interesting, the question, do you believe in God? Um, former Catholics, again, many of them hold on to some remnant of belief but they don't believe in organized religion or the church. Uh, now, in some cases, many of them will go to other Christian groups, but that is pales in comparison to the number who go to no religious affiliation. Um, happy to see that 88% <laughs> of those who identify as Catholics do believe in God. It'd be a little odd to be a Catholic and not believe in God, wouldn't it? Uh, and then others. You can see those figures. Uh, what is God like? What is your view of God? Uh, so I think for people in religious, who, who, who have strong religious affiliation, uh, God is a personal being involved in the lives of people today. Uh, and, and again, we could have an interesting theological conversation. Um, how is God involved in the lives of people today and what does that mean? Uh, God created the world, but is no longer involved in it. Uh, God is not personal, but something like a cosmic life force. Uh, don't know none of the above, uh, and uh, don't believe in God. So, uh, Do you agree or disagree 
that the teachings of science and religion often ultimately conflict with each other. And I guess I'm a little surprised at the extent to which former Catholics, Catholics, and others agree that science and religion ultimately conflict with each other. Again, um, it seems to me that uh, it seems that uh, much of what religiously affiliated schools need to do is to reflect upon and to make an essential part of the curriculum how science and faith relate to each other. Um, and here, agree or disagree, the findings of science and teaching of religion are entirely compatible with each other. So you see the flip side of the, um, but, but again, the point I want to make is how do we look at scientific certainty, scientific truth, and religious truth? How often do, and these are the parents, and again, remember these are followers longitudinally, the parents, how often did you attend uh, religious services? Uh, and you can see that for those who are still uh, Catholic, the parents of emerging adults who were still Catholic attended services uh, much more than those who didn't. And how people talked about religion um, also had uh, an impact. Uh, kind of interesting that the largest number of those who talk about religion are neither Catholics nor former Catholics. Maybe other Christians spend more time talking about uh, their faith and their belief. So, most Catholic youth today are growing up in environments of major religious pluralism, which can make them hesitate to make strong religious commitments themselves. Catholic youth need to be shown how they can simultaneously serious believe, practice, and profess their own faith while appropriately respecting and honoring the faith of others who are different. And uh, many Catholic youth, like their peers, have been convinced that religious faith and modern science are locked in an inevitable war in which science always wins. The church will remove unnecessary obstacles to adult faith by better teaching youth that faith and reason, revelation and science are compatible and mutually reinforcing. Uh, and then uh, their final comment, Young Catholics whose parents regularly attend Mass are involved in parishes who talk with their children about religious faith are more likely to remain Catholic themselves compared to those whose parents are less involved and talk less about religious matters. Um, again, these effects of parents' practices are visible across many different groups, but what makes the Catholics distinct is that their parents have been less likely to engage as heavily and consistently in these practices. The difference between having nominal and in the lives of Catholic versus former Catholic emerging adults. The church can potentially engage with this issue by encouraging parents to adopt consistent small habits expressing faith and making religious practice a fixture in the everyday life of the family. So I think for those of us engaged, uh, especially in Catholic uh, institutions, serving young people, we have been remiss because while indeed the focus has to be on students within the school, we need to take a much broader perspective and realize that our ministry is to not only the children and uh, adolescents in our schools, but to their families as well. Uh, especially for those who are marginal, uh, who who are alienated from the local parish, uh, people who have doubts and questions about their faith, uh, is there a way of welcoming them to the school? And I often think of people, at least in Jesuit uh, schools, for example, uh, both um, in the secondary schools and in, in higher ed, there are people who wouldn't darken the door of a church, right? Uh, but they come to the school, not because it's religious, but I think we need to see uh, the presence of non-practicing people or former Catholics 
uh, as an opportunity uh, within our educational institutions. It's a change of mentality. Um, another study that was uh, just published also uh, is Going, Going, Gone. Um, and it is a, um, out of St. Mary's in Minnesota, but also in association with CARA, again, that Center for Applied Research on the Apostolate, C-A-R-A, -A, Georgetown. Um, if any data you're interested in about the Catholic Church, uh, they have tons of it on their website. So if you just do CARA Georgetown, you will pull it all up. Okay. So this is a study of uh, young of teenagers and young adults who have left the Catholic Church. Uh, and the question is why? A lack of trust and authority caused by the priest pedophilia scandal. He's got to admit it. The greatest wounds of the church are the self-inflicted ones. Two, poor parish administration, including an unwelcoming culture, poor homiletics, a lack of relevance in instruction and programming. Um, we talked about that in class last week, right? The, I think, Rashid, you were mentioning your church and people just not saying good morning and not welcoming them, right? Um, a lot of critiques about lousy homiletics uh, and, and the poor quality, often, of religious education, uh, especially the poor quality of religious education outside of a school context within a parish context. Uh, lack of initiative and creativity in the church, um, and looking at the millennia lost due to poor catechesis, outreach, opportunities to deepen faith, a sense of the lack of relevance on moral and ethical issues. Okay, uh, and, and we talked a little bit about that. Uh, the um, secularism and lack of ethical uh, thinking and, and, and ethical commitment. I think what do we see here, the lack of relevance in a secular society of many moral and ethical issues. So 12.8% of young adults are between 18 and 25 are former Catholics. 6.8 between 15 and 17. 74% said they stopped identifying as Catholic between ages 10 and 20 with the median age of 13. I was really surprised at how young. Wow, what does that say about those in Catholic elementary, middle, and secondary schools? 35% um, are done with religious affiliation, but still believe in something bigger, perhaps even God. There's a kind of a spiritual but not religious sort of thing. 14% uh, say religious affiliation, faith, and nonsensical. And nearly half are looking for another faith expression or practice that better aligns with their sense of spirituality. Uh, have you met any Catholics or Christians who would now consider themselves Buddhist? Or, um, again, anecdotally, it's not huge numbers. Uh, none of the data would indicate that. But, for example, the number of people I know, uh, peers of mine in college, uh, raised in immigrant Irish Catholic families who are now Unitarians because they want to do something church-like, but really with no sense of any creed or any kind of strong religious commitment. Um, <clears throat> back to the uh, surprise that I found looking at these data of the age at which uh, you stop believing as a Catholic, right? And sometimes it's uh, early into childhood, 18%, between five and nine. Um, now, one thing I think it's important to consider, uh, especially for those of us in the Catholic world, that very often we see the world like this. Uh, the United States, um, period. Uh, it's the kind of um, isolationism that is resurgent in our nation now, the kind of um, the early founding of the Republic, you know, we are the city on a hill, we are the New Jerusalem. Uh, and so that uh, kind of American isolationism, that kind of hubris, uh, makes us often not think about the rest of the world. But I often tell, and I think it's very important if you want to understand Catholic education, you have to see uh, the broader uh, context. So uh, in the USA, and we all know this, from the 70s to the 20 teens, uh, it's just been a story of decline. Look at 44% decline in number of students in schools. You can see those figures. The worldwide picture, totally different. Look at that, the increase in the number of students and schools. 
58 million kids, 216,000 schools. Um, quite astounding. Um, and that's due to the shifting uh, regional distribution of Catholics. What's the big story? The big story is, uh, over the 20th century and into the first decade of the 21st, the enormous shift and growth of Catholicism in Sub-Saharan Africa uh, and Asia Pacific. Um, the huge decline in Western Europe, uh, the um, increase in Latin America, and North America being a slight uh, increase. So the shifting demographics uh, away from Western Europe, uh, and if we look to projections uh, looking ahead at 2050, at mid 21st century, 22% of Catholics will be in Africa, 13% in Asia, 41% in Latin America uh, and the Caribbean. Really, it's a Southern Hemisphere church, uh, and we've seen that. Again, if you want to look at some of the data about Europe, uh, go to the Pew uh, website. It's quite interesting. Uh, and trying to be attentive to that. This is a project, a multi-year project that I worked on uh, with Gerald Grace from the University of London, uh, looking at empirical studies of Catholic schools uh, across the world in 30-plus uh, countries. All right, so why do we do Catholic schools? Why is it important to continue? Why do we think it's a faith worth handing on? Um, I think I said this to your class. I've said it to every class I've taught uh, with Catholic educators. Um, when I was Jewish educators a number of years ago, uh, I remember one of the rabbis talking about the growth of Jewish day schools and said the rationale for Jewish schools, the tragedy of a young Jew growing up without knowing the joy of the Jewish way of life. Uh, and I think I've said to you, so the rationale for Catholic schools, the tragedy of a young Catholic growing up without knowing the joy of a Catholic way of life. And often the response is, joy, Catholicism, I don't put those things together. So I think if we are to convince young people that a Catholic way of life is a beautiful, joyful way of life worth living, likewise if we are to, compete, uh, to uh, convince young people that a Christian way of life uh, is a beautiful life, it is a joyful life, it is a life worth living, uh, we need to seriously think about uh, how we approach. I mean, Pope Francis often says, you know, you win no converts with a sour face. Uh, that there has to be something compelling and engaging. Uh, and that's not just words, but it's the way we live together. So, um, I think it's very helpful to look at Evangelii Gaudium, uh, the joy of the gospel, which is the first exhortation of Pope Francis. And I think his words are very important for any of us involved in Christian religious leadership. He says, the joy of the gospel fills the hearts and lives of all who encounter Jesus. Uh, those who accept his offer of salvation set free from sin or inner emptiness and loneliness. Um, so he wrote this to encourage Christian faithful to embark on a new chapter of evangelization. Back to that Chinese character. You ever talk about the opportunity piece, right? Marked by this joy. Pastoral mission ministry, he says, in a missionary style, is not obsessed with the disjointed transmission of a multitude of doctrines to be insistently imposed. Wow. How often do we hear that from Catholic pulpits? Huh? The message has to concentrate on the essentials, on what is most beautiful, most grand, most appealing, and at the same time most necessary. The message is simplified while losing none of its depth, or none of its truth, and becomes all the more forceful and convincing. Uh, within the Catholic Church, and not so much, I think, within other Christian groups, but certainly within the Catholic Church, just reaffirmed this past week by the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith, uh, is the barring women from priestly ministry. Um, that's not likely to change, and, and we can have a big conversation about that. But in any event, um, that uh, having said that, nonetheless, the role of women within the church um, and women's leadership within the Catholic Church has to be looked at very seriously. 
and to look at broader opportunities. Uh, there is discussion, for example, uh, and there seems to be some evidence that in the early church there were women deacons, also, uh, and local diocesan administration chancellors, for example, of dioceses, who have serious and uh, responsibility and decision-making power are women. So that's crucial. Um, youth ministry, which is what we are involved in, has suffered the impact of the social changes that we've just heard about earlier in the lecture. Uh, young people often fail to find responses to their concerns, needs, problems, and hurts in the usual structures. As adults, we find it hard to listen patiently to them. Think back to the job interview with the millennium, right? To appreciate their concerns and demands, to speak to them in a language they can understand. Uh, even if it's not always easy to approach young people, uh, progress has been made, awareness that the entire community is called to evangelize, and the urgent need for the young to exercise greater leadership. Passing on the faith that is worth claiming. Um, we should recognize, despite the present, present crisis of commitment and communal relationships, that's interesting too, it's not just commitment, but it's also community and the yearning for community. Among many young people are making common cause before the problems of our world and are taking up various forms of activism and volunteer work. We see it in Jesuit schools very often where there's an espousal of social justice, but there is not a similar espousal of, of faith. And we talk about faith and justice as the two kind of goals. So young people call us to renewed and expansive hope. They represent new directions for humanity. They open us to the future. Lest we cling to a nostalgia for structures and customs that are no longer life-giving. Uh, so uh, this year is particularly important. Uh, the Senate of Bishops uh, in uh, October, the entire church representative of all the universal church looking at young people, faith, and vocational discernment. And again, I think uh, certainly crucial for uh, those of us who are Catholic, but I think much to be learned about uh, reaching out to young people with the message of Christ, uh, with the uh, gospel, uh, with evangelizing uh, for all of us. Uh, there is, in the way the Vatican functions before these big meetings, what they call a working paper, an instrumentum laboris. Um, and so they create that by surveys of young people around the entire world. So what do young people yearn for? Uh, they want supportive, uplifting, authentic, and accessible communities. Uh, the need to support families, not just youth. And as I said, the Christian Smith study. Uh, many parishes are no longer a place of connection, no kidding. A uh, church that is inclusive, welcoming, merciful, and tender. Uh, and, and to see diversity as a richness and not a problem in a pluralistic world. Uh, to engage with and address the social justice issues of our justice, but fail to see the connection to the gospel. Uh, the wide gap between the desires of young people and their capacity to make long-term decisions. That whole notion of discernment. Uh, the ambiguity of technology with what uh, the former Superior General of Judgment said, uh, the globalization of superficiality with all the gifts and graces and opportunities of technology is also uh, the increase of superficiality. And so the need for an education for depth, depth of thought, depth of relationship, and the search for meaning in life. Uh, young people want authentic witness. We have talked about that. Huh? Kind leaders, there you go. Uh, People with an ethical code that they not just espouse, but they also live. They need to encounter the mission of Christ. They're attracted to joy, talked about that, which would be a hallmark of faith, uh, discernment, and their longing for an authentic church. So that's the crisis and the opportunity. Uh, and I think when we look at the crisis, we want to be energized and we don't want to be paralyzed. Um, so. I think we need to engage an honest assessment of the religious climate for Catholics and other Christians. Um, we need to listen to the experience of the disaffected. We need to make passing on the faith a highest priority of the church. And in, often in diocese, that's not the case. And we need to shape leadership on the service of faith, of which the promotion of justice is an essential requirement, linking faith and justice. Um, finally, let me close with the historical perspective. Uh, very often, I think, we uh, see our time as unique. Uh, Jim O'Toole, a colleague of mine in the history department at Boston College, 
wrote a wonderful book on American Catholics called The Faithful. And I think for Catholics and for uh, other Christians, uh, this holds true. Understanding the successive ages of their church may open them to accepting change whether they want it or not. The church and its people have never stood still in changing times, and they cannot do so now. So I hope this has been a helpful, uh, providing information, stimulating thought, um, and I look forward to uh, hearing you discuss these issues uh, in the discussion sections uh, online and in our next class.